The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast, featuring interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147. And in this podcast, we're going to talk about some of the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficial insects that help to control them. Today's guest on the Pest and Predator podcast is Dr. James Tanzi. He's a provincial entomologist in Saskatchewan, and today we're going to talk all about grasshoppers. Jim, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How's it going? I'm doing great. So a lot of growers are really concerned about grasshoppers this year. What are the common species of grasshoppers that growers should be aware of? Because not every grasshopper is the same. That's absolutely true. So, I, I mean, in Western Canada, we've got 85 species of grasshopper. Typically, only about four of these are going to be pests in Saskatchewan. These include the clearwing grasshopper, migratory grasshopper, packards, and two-stripe grasshopper. Uh, the, uh, the thing that all of these have in common is, is they overwinter as eggs, and they tend to not be present as adults until mid-July, August. Uh, that said, we've got some early emergence or, or early development of clearwing grasshoppers in some parts of the province currently. And it, it seems like we're... Like with all the dryness, is that conducive to grap- grasshoppers, or is it just kind of like an old wives' tale? Uh, it's conditionally conducive. Uh, there, there are other environmental factors that are important, but typically the dry weather is going to stop them from, you know, uh, uh, um, direct population reductions associated with drowning, uh, you know, uh, uh, bacterial and fungal infections of the eggs. Uh, uh, and that sort of thing. So the dry conditions, as a rule, contribute to population increase. There, there are some slight differences in, in different species as far as their preferences for, for moisture, but overall, that's a good general rule. And and what kind of what, which crops do they do they are they prone to attacking? And what kind of impact and damage to the crop will they cause? Different grasshopper species have different preferences. Uh, so when we're talking migratory packards and two stripe, uh, they're they're pretty broad generalists. So I mean, a lot is on the menu for those ones. When we're talking about clearing grasshopper, they tend to prefer grasses. So cereal crops are particularly vulnerable vulnerable for those ones. Flax uh, can occasionally suffer damage from these ones, but as a rule, uh, uh, if it falls outside of that uh, of that grass group, it's it's not going to be terribly susceptible to clearing unless populations are very very high. So as you look at the Prairie Provinces right now, what are we seeing in terms of populations, and, and how does that compare to the forecast maps that were out earlier? Uh, things so far are stacking up uh, pretty consistently with what the forecast map showed. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, we, we uh, uh, SEIC does a, a survey of, of about uh, um, uh, 11 to 1,200 sites or, or throughout the province of Saskatchewan every year, uh, typically late in the summer. And uh, what they uh, found was that uh, numbers were relatively low across the province. We had a couple of warm spots um, in uh, in uh, the uh, the uh, southwest and a little bit in the southeast, uh, a little bit north of Swift Current, but uh, but uh, nothing beyond the uh, the uh, what would be considered to be light populations. We are seeing little hot spots. Uh, so I've gotten a recent report, as I mentioned before, of clearing grasshopper coming up in some numbers. Uh, southeast of Weyburn, uh, that's in rangelands, so uh, 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 the, you know, the potential for them to move into nearby cereal crops certainly exists, and, and growers should, should keep an eye out for that. An important consideration with the, uh, with the survey, though, is that uh, uh, despite the large number of sites that are hit, we still suffer a bit from resolution because we're not hitting every site. Uh, so, or every field, pardon me. So it's still really important for, for growers to be out there or and agronomists to be out there to actually look at what's happening with their populations um, and also look at the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network uh, uh, site because there, there is a degree to accumulation to let them know when the grasshoppers uh, uh, will, be, uh, will be coming up and, uh, and some developmental uh, uh, um, information as well. So, uh, yeah, with that, typically, you know, mid-July, August, we'll, we'll start to see, uh, uh, you know, the late and star nymphs and the, and the adults uh, coming up, you know, so the big ones, so that's when they're, they're, they're going to start causing serious damage. Uh, that said, uh, we all, you know, we have a population of clear wings that's, uh, that's already reached adulthood in the southeast. So, so Jim, how do, how do I scout for them? Like, obviously, I can drive around and 
see what's left on the grill of the truck. But, uh, you know, how, how should I be scouting for them? Yeah, the method that we recommend is, is to, to look at a, at a 50 meter section. Uh, so that is, you can you can do it in the ditch next to the field or, or, or in the field. Uh, so you're going to want to uh, stake that out or, you know, mark it in some way. So you got 50 meters, uh, walk, you know, one long step. So that is a meter and try to scare up everything you can. Count everything in your, in your peripheral vision. You might want to have a little quicker uh, counter with you or a piece of paper and repeat 50 times. Divide that by 50 and that'll be your square meter count. Okay. What are some of the factors that contribute to grasshopper populations when we look at uh, Western Canada? Yeah, well, uh, we, we did talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, temperature, certainly. I mean, they are ectotherms, so that's, you know, that's going to have uh, influence all aspects of their development. So, you know, the, the time for them to reach adulthood, uh, their, uh, their propensity to catch diseases, uh, you know, the activity of their natural enemies. Uh, so temperature is very important. Moisture is very important. Um, you know, in, in midsummer, we can get those hot, sticky days and that, that can contribute to, uh, to, uh, infection with a fungus called, uh, Entomophthora grillii. Uh, so there are, there are different isotypes or, or different lines of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, sorry, isotype is the wrong, uh, the wrong term, uh, different lines of uh, Entomophthora that, that affect different species of gra- uh, grasshopper differently. But what we saw last year in the area where we're seeing that, uh, that, that, that localized outbreak of clearing grasshopper uh, was that they were getting laid low by the Zentomothra. So it's it's a fungus that causes them to climb to the top of a plant and they grab on tight and they die there and, and rain fungal spores down on, on their brothers and sisters and cousins. Uh, so it had a relatively profound effect on this population, not so much it wiped them out. You know, they are obviously roaring back. Typically, it's not going to not going to have much more than, you know, about a 5 percent reduction in population, but it can it can be very uh, very devastating, but it's seen those those hot sticky days seem to contribute to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, that infection at any rate. What predators help to control the grasshopper? They are a uh, delicious hoppy bag of food. Uh, there are a lot of things that love to eat them. Um, we, I mean, we've got a number of vertebrates that love to eat them. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, American kestrel is a little falcon. Uh, that'll consume them. Burrowing owls are major, uh, pre- or, well, major local predators. Uh, garter snakes will eat them. Uh, prairie stapler toads, uh, ground squirrels will eat them. Uh, a number of different uh, uh, songbirds as well. Uh, we've also got uh, um, uh, generalist uh, uh, arthropod predators as well. So things like robber flies, which are great big flies that actually hunt on the wing and they'll actually snatch them out of the air. Uh, and they're they're comparable in size, you know, maybe a little bit smaller than a grasshopper, and they'll take down a grasshopper that's larger than they are. Uh, we all we also have a little, uh, well, it's actually a decent sized fessed wasp, uh, you know, about the size of a yellow jacket. It's called the Great Golden Sand Digger. Isn't that a great name? That's awesome. Uh, it, yeah, <laughs> I got that. so it, it's a parasitoid, a uh, solitary parasitoid. So so what she is doing, she'll she'll go out. Uh, uh, and uh, dig uh, individual little burrows, and she's going to grab grasshoppers, uh, sting them, and stuff them down into these little holes, lay an egg on them, and let the larvae develop. You know, uh, rinse, repeat, and then uh, um, uh, you know to uh, to contribute to the next uh, to the next generation. So once again, they're, they're solitary. Uh, they're they're quite a gorgeous animal, actually. If anybody's curious uh, to look them up. Uh, Grabbed beetles can be tremendously important predators of, uh, of grasshoppers as well. You know, uh, uh, the predaceous ground beetles, they'll eat anything they can tackle, and they can tackle prey items that are larger than they are. Similar with uh, with wolf spiders, they'll take down anything they can tackle, and, and, and they can take down prey, uh, prey items that are larger than they are as well. So you, ex- you explained how these beneficials work. How can a farmer protect them to, so that there's more activity and they're, they're doing that more of that work for you for free? Yeah, there's, you know, there. I think uh, uh, economic thresholds are the most important thing. Like, don't don't spray until you have to. Um, you're protecting the natural enemies, and uh, you're not spending money that you don't have to. Um, so, if if your if your cost of control is greater than the benefit that you're that you're going to get from applying the chemical, it's it doesn't make economic sense to uh, to apply the insecticide. In addition, you know, just for, just from a straight you know dollar to dollar comparison. Uh, not to mention what it's, you know, the potential effects it could have on natural enemies. So some of some of the products, there are a lot of products that are registered for grasshopper control in a lot of crops. 
some of these have some mammalian toxicity and they have some vertebrate toxicity, and this needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and some of them are more specific. Uh, they, you know, they uh, they only affect specific groups of insects, and uh, and uh, can be more selective. And so choices should be made uh, made based on that. You mentioned that there are products out there to control grasshoppers. When do growers need to think about some of these control strategies? Yeah, I think it's it's important for for them to be monitoring populations mid summer. You know, probably early July and on. Uh, you know, depending on how much heat is heat is accumulated, and uh, and I think early July isn't too early for that. Uh, you know, regular regular monitoring is important. Uh, it's good to keep an eye on the size of the actual grasshoppers in the population. Um, if they get over, you know, about a half inch, you know, you might want to start con- consider uh, uh, controlling if they if they're at the economic threshold. And the economic threshold varies for different crops. So for most crops, we recommend 10 to 12 per square meter. Uh, but there are some crops that are particularly sensitive. So flax, when it's in bowl and lentil are both very sensitive to grasshopper feeding. Uh, so we recommend two per square meter in, in those cases. And, and those need to be considered by growers before they, uh, before they put a spray on. Jim, you've, you've mentioned a few species that will attack the grasshopper. Are there any more? Uh, there are lots. Um, there are important predators of grasshopper eggs. And so these include field crickets, uh, which, are, which will happily munch on grasshopper eggs. Bee flies and blister beetles will also uh, deposit their eggs in soil near, near grasshopper eggs. And bee flies, some species at any rate, will actually hover uh, over where uh, grasshoppers have laid their eggs and flick their abdomen. And they're actually flicking eggs down the hole. Uh, so these can be important predators of grasshopper eggs. Uh, uh, there are some worms as well, some unsegmented worms that can be important for uh, for uh, grasshoppers. Uh, well, particularly from the perspective of a grasshopper. Uh, one is called mermis, and uh, in this case, uh, a- adult nematodes can be very large, 20 centimeters. Uh, so the uh, they're they're going to lay eggs on plants. Uh, the uh, adult nematodes are actually they're unsegmented uh, unsegmented worms, as I mentioned before. They'll actually move over the plant. Plants. Uh, they can lay eggs on the plant, and then the, the grasshoppers consume the microscopic eggs, and and the uh, the uh, nematodes uh, hatch up inside the grasshopper and uh, uh, and uh, cause uh, sterilization and eventual death. Uh, when death does occur, it's like an explosion of worms. So the, the worms come pouring out of this of this animal. Uh, another one are uh, horsehair worms or nematomorphs. Uh, and an important genus of these is Gordius. And these, again, can be very large, up to 40 centimeters long. Uh, so uh, uh, adults are generally only in water. Larvae are, are free swimming. So if, if uh, a grasshopper comes and feeds on or takes a drink from, uh, from, uh, from some water, there's a chance it could take some of these larvae up in, uh, that are free swimming in the water. Uh, these develop inside the grasshopper and uh, uh, also cause sterilization, much like the nematode uh, and eventual death. Uh, the really, the real insidious bit about this one is that it actually causes the grasshopper to seek water when the, when the horsehair worm has completed development. The grasshopper hits water, and uh, the adult uh, horsehair worm essentially explodes out of the grasshopper. Uh, oftentimes, out of the uh, we'll say the lower digestive system of, uh, of a grasshopper. So it's a little bit of, a little bit equivalent of, you know, a a 30-foot worm exploding out of you if you went swimming. So um, it's hard to be a grasshopper. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you what, you entomologists, you guys guys have some pretty cool, gory stories when it comes to some of these uh, parasitoids. Oh, it's hard to be a bug. Yeah, it really is. It's hard to be a bug. And we never even talked about how grasshoppers can make pretty good fish bait, too. Oh, they absolutely can, yeah. Yeah, just add fish to the list of... uh, uh, species that like to uh, chew on the grasshopper. Jim, thanks a lot for joining us here today on the Pest and Predator Podcast. Oh, my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator Podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.